This is a really, really interesting panel, especially given the times we're in. I'm Randall Lane. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Forbes. And uh, I would like to think that this is the start of a good joke. Like, you know, what happens when a cardinal, a rabbi, a sheikh, and a professor walk into a bar? But uh, it's actually a great panel uh, that's going to push, uh, I think, push a lot of people's thinking, uh, both here in the room and, most important, around the world. Uh, WEF put out a report recently uh, in conjunction coming up to, to the, um, the conference here about uh, faith, uh, faith in action, faith in the workplace specifically, which is something that I think previously is something that isn't discussed much or hasn't been discussed much. And some of the outcome, some of the outlines, some of the top lines were really, really surprising, I think, to a lot of lay people. 85% uh, of people in this world identify, 80 85% identify uh, as part of a religious community. So this is a large majority of the world. And what the report focused on a lot was how it, this affects the workplace, uh, and specifically how this can affect the workplace in a positive way. So I think that's what we're going to try to talk about here today, uh, is positivity. Because, you know, uh, faith can be one of the great ultimate uh, forces for good in the world, and there's also been a lot of bad things done in the world over history in the name uh, in the name of faith, uh, incorrectly, but in the name of faith. And so I think what we're here to do is talk about this specifically with the lens through the workplace, but also through creating change at scale. And we have a terrific, terrific panel uh, to talk about. So I'll go right down the line, and I'll do a quick intro, and then we'll get right into it. I have right to my left, I have uh, Colonel Turkson, who is the uh, chancellor at two of the top uh, academies, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences of the Holy See. Thank you, Cardinal, for being here. Uh, next, we have uh, Harry Hahn, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins, who specifically studies, she's a professor of pol political science, and specifically studies the role uh, of faith uh, in the workplace, in society, and politics. Uh, and then next, we have uh, Sheikh Al Mofuz bin Baya, Secretary General of the Abu Dhabi Forum for Peace. Uh, I've been going to Abu Dhabi uh, every twice a year, you know, and the work that you've done over the last 10 years, you could feel it. There's a new, uh, there's a new uh, Abrahamic Museum honoring all three religions that I've been watching go up year by year near the Louvre. And you actually can see, physically see the difference uh, that you're making. So we appreciate Sheikh you being here. And then last we have Rabbi Pincus Goldschmidt, uh, the chief rabbi of Moscow right now in, um, in absentia, uh, the president of the Conference of European Rabbis and a, and a great leader and we thank you for your leadership in terms of being uh, a force, a uh, positive force in terms of speaking at, about the, uh, the war in Ukraine. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to throw this out, and I want to encourage us to have a conversation in the spirit of interfaith and the spirit of uh, mutual respect, which is why you know, it's such an honor to have you all here, about what, you know, I think the first question is, the, the, the report talks a lot about positivity. What, what do you think... And I'll, you know, whoever wants to jump in first is driving, and what's the key driver for positive change? Positive change, using religious religion for positive change, especially in the workplace, but also, you know, in other aspects of society. What do you think the, the number one driver is that you've seen? Anybody? Jake? You study this. You, we all study it, but you, 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 know, you live this at your forum. Oh, I like always to talk the last one because I would benefit from their answers, <laughs> especially when you put me between rabbi and cardinal and uh, professor, yes. so I'm not one of them. But um, I will say knowing one another, it's very important. So I think the, the line between, um, in Arabic they said, if you ignore something, you create it as an enemy. So I think if, you, if we knowing one another, more I am in touch with rabbis and cardinals and pastors and professors that specialize in this. I feel the barriers is go down and do I see them as just my brothers in humanity or even my brothers in the faith of the existence of God and uh, looking for better solution and changing religion for religion for peace. I think knowing one another, it's very important uh, concept. Professor, what are you seeing? 
Yeah, um, so I do a lot of um, work with um, the evangelical community in the United States, and um, you know, one of the big mega churches that I've studied a lot, they have this saying that I think really captures what the Sheikh was just what, saying. What percentage of the U.S. is uh, identifies as evangelical? evangelical? Identifies as a Christ, evangelical Christian, Correct. about a third. Okay. Yeah, so it's a pretty large, it's a, it's a lar it's the largest single um, faith tradition. But um, there's a saying that one of the communities that we do a lot of work with, which I think really captures what you said, which is this idea that belonging comes before belief. Um, which is really powerful if you think about it, because we live in a world where so many of the organizations that we have put belief before belonging, right? Like first you have to adhere to a certain um, kind of uh, orthodoxy, and then you're invited to become a part of the community, and I think these faith communities sort of really build um, off of this idea that anyone is welcome. What specifically, I might push you on that, the interaction between faith and race, which is something that also, you know, I know you've done some work with, and that, you know, how, how does that play out, and how can that be a force for positivity? Right. So, um, so in the United States, at least, you know, obviously the white evangelical and the black evangelical community and sort of other kind of um, evangelical communities tend to be very separate. But what we see is that um, here's a couple data points. Um, so uh, the largest 9% of churches in the U.S. capture 50% of the church-going population, right? So um, church attendance is heavily skewed towards big churches. Um, and the average uh, large church over the past decade, um, it used to be that only, um, you know, something like 20% of them were multiracial. And now you see that almost half of them are multiracial. And almost all of them have become more multiracial over time. And so we're starting to see more mixing than we had in the past. So I think there's opportunities there that, um, that haven't been realized. So, you know, I think that's a good way to segue to talk, Rabbi, about how what you've seen in terms of the work you've been doing for the last couple of years about religious as a for, religion as a force for peace. Right. Um, I think right now it doesn't feel like that to a lot of the world as they look at it. But you've been, you know, you've been very, very, you know, you've been a leader in terms of trying to create a peace movement. Yes. Um, religious leaders uh, have a key role to play. And played a key role in many instances for peace in the past, uh, uh, talking about um, a person who was also many times invited to the uh, World Economic Forum, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, who peacefully was there to end apartheid, and priest who worked under Pinochet, and, and speaking from my experience in Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church, um, one of the great experts on the Russian Orthodox Church was James Billington, who was the librarian of the Library of Congress, who said back then in, I think, 1992, that the church can be a vehicle for change for democratization or can be there just to bring back Russia to a totally authoritarian past. And we have seen what happened during the last uh, 30 years. It's exactly what happened with the help of the church. Uh, Rabbi, uh, um Following up on that, your work in your work in Ukraine. How has that? Has some of the things you've talked about there affected your work there? Um, there was a lot of pressure on religious leaders in Russia to support the war. Once the war didn't go the, the way they thought they would go against Ukraine, and uh, I left Russia and decided uh, it is my a duty to be there with the victims, not with the perpetrators. And we went and we helped the refugees who left Ukraine. There were 10 million refugees back then. And uh, we criticized the war. I had to resign because of that. And what I think is very important, and uh, I've seen also religious leaders of other faith in, in the Orthodox Church and other churches who took a position and criticized the war. However, there is no support system for them. There was no support system for them, not from business, not from NGOs, not from the media. And uh, actually, it, it is um, when people ask me, why are you one of the only ones who spoke out against the war? It says, because there is no support system for those who want to do that. Uh, I want to segue to Colonel. You've been similarly doing work in another area that we're talking about. We've heard a lot about Ukraine here this week at WEF. We, of course, hear a lot about climate change. You've been a real leader in terms of uh, the Vatican, the Vatican, and pushing a very positive and, and aggressive message on, on climate change. Tell us how you interact with that vitally important topic as a religious leader. Okay, so thanks. And in, in the in the first place, I think the very uh, first question you put about the role of religion and all. I think I think I think the basic uh, fact to recognize about religion or faith is that it helps to understand 
the basic, let's say, the anthropological question, who is the human person? And the, true, the understanding of the human person is based on its sense of relationship with a deity or whatever. So the sense of the human person, the basic anthropological question is properly answered when you're talking about it with faith leaders or religious leaders by reference to their faith, by their reference to their affirmation of a deity or a god above them and all, which serves to explain what it means to be human, what it means to be man, and what it means to engage in society in very many ways. It's, it's, this, I think, is a very basic, very basic point to note that our sense of religion gives us an understanding about our own self, what it means to be human. And from understanding about what it means to be human, also understand how, how it means to, you know, what it means to engage for the promotion of the, of the well-being of the human person and all. This is how, I think from the part of the church in the Vatican, we have proceeded. It's always faith leads to the understanding of basic anthropological question. Who is the human person and what is his life for and what, you know, what kind of things he engages in? So everything we've done has been by way of dealing with that. Therefore, uh, we find religion to be very concrete. It's a way of promoting the well-being of the human person, giving sense and value to everything that it means to be human. <clears throat> it also means that we do not consider the human person as self-creating. It was created, therefore has to acquire a sense of his own being with reference to his creator and all. And that has led us to you know, engage in several terms by way of promoting this. And so, for example, uh, you mentioned a few things with the climate and all. What we began or started of doing is to help place the human person and its concern at the center of economy or economics. So we developed a small booklet called The Vocation of the Business Leader. It was an attempt to encourage business leaders to recognize that the, value, the true value of business is how it promotes the well-being of the human person. And it's the same thing that we've done with mining companies. Same thing we've done with energy. Uh, you know, when we did convoke the sea of uh, oil and gas companies in the Vatican, it was for the same thing. So uh, the sense of the human person drawn from our faith or religion is what inspires the very many ways that we engage in concrete action for society and the well-being of the human well, person. Thinking, you know, maybe you could talk about your work with the Council for Inclusive Capitalism. The right. idea, the idea. Okay. Right, I mean, the idea that the Vatican is actually, you know, taking, right. you know, taking steps directly with business. How does that work? Yeah, it it it, it was so. Uh, we say, for example, true business, uh, be, be, be business people produce goods. So they need to ensure if the goods are meant to serve the well-being of the human person, then the goods to be truly good. It's not goods that, you know. You're putting the good in goods. I yeah, like the, true, the goods to be truly good. The working force that produces the goods to be truly, you know, dignifying work. The proceeds of the work should also, the wealth created, must also be equally, you know, shared and all. So everything about labor and work is not just about maximizing profit. It's everything doesn't to promote the well-being of the human person. Yep. Sheikh, you, you've been... Uh... You've been, the only topic I think that we've been talking more about than climate change, which we discussed, is AI. And you've been actually focused a lot on how AI will change business, how it will change religion. You've been studying that. What, what have been your fan, findings so far? First, um, I want to thank the, the, these uh, people that have been behind this, Dave and others, to make this happening. Because um, I remember when they have C-100 long time ago, and we all, as a religion community, would benefit from the ideas of C-100 at that time. And maybe the work we're doing, even what we reach now from our goals has come from that realms. So we thank them so much for creating, again, this plan of action that we would love to see. And I would love to host next year on the side of the World Economic Forum, a World Peace Forum. 
in conjunction with uh, World Economic Forum and uh, my organization will take care of 100 participants if they agree with that and support it. So that's just something I want to throw in front of all, all of you to support me. Please do your best, especially. You, you can't I, have peace without a good economy, by the way. Professor so. Catherine Marshall, she's here, and she should be the one talking behalf of Islam here because of how much she provides ideas for us all these times when we was working a hard time. Second thing, for um, your question, it's about uh, AI. We're working with the uh, Vatican and the uh, rabbis of Israel about how to create, um, uh, to have AI and ethics to remind the, the companies of the human needs and ethics. And this concern to every family, to every person, he's gonna send his kids to school and he's gonna learn from AI that there is other body that's not controlling, but reminding. We are reminders, we are not controllers. When it's come to religion and belief, we are not controllers. We don't control anyone. We don't control anyone to move from this religion to other religion. And that's why my organization started the work with a Marrakesh Declaration for protecting non-Muslim minority in Muslim majority countries. And that was because of the feeling to prevent genocide in the name of the religion. And that time, really, we see some bad things happening in Iraq and other places, and we had that declaration. For that. So AI now, it's a paradigm shift. We're all scared from everything new. And just three days ago, I was in a gathering for 1,000 youth and women and leaders of religion in Africa in Nouakchott, Mauritania, attended by two presidents of Africa. That's the platform we create in Africa, just to talk about African problems and African issue, mm -hmm. not to parachute religion from Middle East or other place to Africa. No, African, they need to think about their own. So we talk about AI. And for them, it's not purity, and they don't care. They already have a lot of things before they think about AI. But we want to, to really to, uh, uh, we've been able to host some people online to explain for them what is AI, and that's very priority for us, and I think it's in plan of, plan of action. They have this priority of AI, sorry for to talk long. But. We're, we're, at the, uh, no, we're at the World Economic Forum. I was asked to moderate this, I'm sure, because Forbes, we're starting, and we have started a community, a faith-forward community that right now on LinkedIn, uh, and I look forward to when it starts to become an in-person community too. What, I'd like each of you, and maybe we'll start with, Rabbi, we'll start with you and come on down. What do each of you think makes a business faith forward versus kind of, you know, faith private? I think faith uh, provides... Um, or faith phobic, really. What? Faith... What, what makes a business faith forward versus faith, faith phobic? I think the, um, uh, there's a, a lot of misconception about uh, the faith is the cause for wars, for, for problems, for divisions, for uh, people not ready to, to work together. But uh, just take, uh, give you one example. Uh, one of the great achievements of last years was with the Abrahamic Accords uh, in the Arab Peninsula with Israel, the, you know, the Emirates, um, Bahrain, and Sudan and Morocco. Now, what is interesting is that um, the title of this arrangement was not uh, some the middle, new middle, it was Abraham, Abraham or Ibrahim. It was a religious figure w which unites actually the faith, the old Abrahamic faith, and this was the uniting um, example which actually created the new Middle East. So this could happen in terms of business and faith as well when uh, uh, doors open and uh, you, you see the commonalities and uh, I've seen this many times when I was sitting with my colleagues from other faiths, whether the priests or imams, and when we started talking about our common problems, we saw we have very similar problems with our constituencies, with our communities, and uh, the, the world is equal. Sheikh? Um, first, I will ask for all of you to pray for the innocent people dying everywhere in the world. And we don't care about their religion or where they are, just we need all to it, especially in Gaza now, when they're facing this machine of this. They died every day if you turn the TV on, and it's just we hope 
to call for ceasefire and just to try a different way of fighting extremism. We're all against extremism. We're all against what happened in 7 October. We're all against it, but we're all against the fact that that's innocent people, kids, women, yeah. all the people dying, thousands. This is not something any religion can accept it. So we hope all religion, they will stand up and to condemn the killing of innocent people as we stand up and condemn the killing of innocent people anywhere in the world. So please consider And return that. the hostages back to their families. Yeah, exactly, but the families, sometimes they fight. <laughs> so uh, some, some families fight, but other, they should stand up and to stop anyone. He's really aggressive. I, I think what I'm hearing is consensus that, you know, uh, violence in the name of religion is always is, is bad. Harry, I'd like to talk to you, you know, ask you about specifically, you know, especially in the U.S., which has a very obviously advanced, uh, you know, system, cor corporate system about how uh, a business becomes faith forward in sure. a positive way. Yeah, I mean, building on these um, comments, the um, you know, like at this forum, we've been talking so much about AI as, as we talked about. And what's interesting to me is that so much of the conversation about AI is really about humanity. Like, what does it mean to be human? And um, when you think about it, it's like, you know, technology can improve the ways in which we optimize on certain things, but it's faith um, that really teaches us what it is that we want to optimize. And so businesses, to me, that are faith forward are kind of asking both those questions at the same time, but not in a way that creates divisiveness, right, but in a way that actually creates an openness and a tolerance to lots of different answers that people might have about what it is that we want to optimize and how we all maximize a kind of human well, I, should, I think that's a great, you know, because even here we're talking about what's going on, you know, in Israel and Gaza, and at the end of the day, if there's a dialogue that could be positive, the dialogue is good, and if the dialogue is negative, and especially in a, in a, at a company, you know, you, what you don't want is your workers fighting with each other. It's just it's true of a university, it's true of your friends. But how do we, you know, and so I think that's, there, there's a roadmap here for how this, you know, we, we were able to have dialogues and do it in a positive way that actually brings people together. Rabbi, you're, and then Rabbi Cardinal, you're, you're, um, you're you know, you spend a lot of time with specific companies. Mm. Who, who do you, who's doing this well? <laughs> yeah. I, or generally what direction, <laughs> you know, right. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but no, you know, you, you're studying this and what, have, what, what are some, what's a case study or, or something you've seen that works that people could a, a take away for everybody? No, I think, I think, I think uh, business people, uh, pretty well inspired and motivated when, for example, we draw the attention to the fact that uh, if, for example, we're talking about economics, and from our point of view of faith, economics is two words put together, oikos, household, nomos, administration. So true economics. Don't they, mess with people who are fluent in Latin, by the way. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this is, it's, it's like so true economics is the management of the resources of a household to the satisfaction of all members of the household. If this sense is what inspires business, then the aim of business is not maximization of profit; is to manage the resources mm -hmm. so all members of the household have their needs taken care of. What we may call the common good. Right? So true business as economists or economists is the management of resources of this household, if it's the earth, all of humanity, if it's whatever. So, so that is inspiring for some business people to, to, to probably accept a paradigm shift where business does not aim at maximizing profit, but optimizing gains. When you optimize gains, it means you pursue whatever, but with some other values taken on board. And those, ta those are the type of things we seek to uh, promote with a lot of business people, and it resonates well with them. And so when we came out, for example, with that document about the vocation of business leader, we said, business, what do you do? You just processing raw material that you are not responsible for, you did not create. Here we're sitting behind furniture. God created tree, he didn't create furniture. It takes business to convert trees into furniture. So businesses process something that already exists. If it's glass, there's crystal sand. And business converts that into glass or glasses for our concrete use. So it's good for business people to recognize that they already use raw material for which they're not responsible. 
And that disposes them to also be sharing in whatever in whatever they do. So some, you know, so some less business in the most you yeah. know, faith based you know, that we're yeah, so all that, just borrowing the earth, right? right? So if, we're all if, just borrowing if, what if, we if have. The question is how does faith inspire all of this? These are considerations. Initially it appears to be so remote, but when you sit down with business people and talk like that, you sitting on chairs. What is that? Plastic and iron. Oil, right? Process into plastic for human use. So business, therefore, we call that we call business co-creators. Mm -hmm. They transform the raw material of creation into concrete use for humanity, mm -hmm. and that enables them to feel how noble you know their exercises, but at the same time how responsible they should be in imitating the goodness of God that bestowed this on humanity in the well, no, that's, I already see your next book, Business. <laughs> Business is Godliness. <laughs> Business is Godliness. We have about four minutes. Uh, maybe I'll see if the room wants to ask a question. We, we'll give it to you for your, the last question, sir. This is a very naive question and probably altruistic, but going back to the comment that first you have belief and then you have belonging, that's true. But is there some way that um, in a week when you're quite right. We've either been talking about AI or we've been talking about climate, and I found myself talking about both. It just seems to me that um, unless we look at climate as a human problem, nothing's going to get done. Um, I think one of the great and extraordinary successes of religion and re or religious religions is the ability to convene people, disparate people, around a common goal. Um, I just wonder whether there's some way on a sort of ecumenical level that the religions could come together not to talk about faith. That can come, that can come later, if you, so if you can turn it from belief to belonging, from belonging to belief, but somehow create an environment where we can learn from the success of religion over many centuries of the ability to convene people and actually start to make a difference on the, on the, on the topic such as climate because it ain't going to get yep. fixed so, without so, something along those lines. So we'll go right down the line of the final comment. 30 seconds, that's a very good question. It really speaks of faith in action. How do we use convening to, to create action? I, I, Bye -bye. I think you're 100% right because uh, one of the great things about religions, it lets you think not only about your life or your 70s, 80 years you're, you're here in this world, let, let you think about the afterlife, you have to think of what will, what's gonna happen in 100 and 200 years from now, and it's exactly what uh, the problem of global, global warming is all about, because you don't have to think of yourself, you have to think of your children. So here I think the faith can do a lot of things together. Thank you. Shake, um, shake. Um, in our tradition, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, if you see the day, uh, the end, uh, the day, uh, the, the end coming, and you have a seal in your hand, you should put it on. So it's always is about hope for the future. And when you are uh, uh, firmer and you put uh, uh, olive trees, you know it will take them long time to give a fruit. So it's always you do it for other generations. And I think our religion is it's, it's full of like encouraging people to work for the uh, for the next generations. Professor. Um, so just to clarify, um, so the, the church's, I think, the saying is that belonging comes before belief, and I think the misperception is that belief comes first and then belonging comes second. And so what they're saying is that, look, you know, whether or not you believe in our God, you're welcome, you're a part of us. You don't have to believe in our God, you don't have to believe in any God, like you're a part of our community. And so they do that very convening, I think, on, an, on a weekly basis. But you know, at, on this panel and in the report, we see all sorts of examples where faith communities are doing that with the private sector, with all sorts of other kinds of organizations to solve really complicated problems because I think they have a moral authority to bring people together and convene them in a way that other organizations cannot. Last word, Colonel. <laughs> so uh, with particular reference to the issue of ecology, that you referred to, faith leaders have already come together to do that. Uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople was the one who began uh, interpreting our, re our treatment of uh, everything and the yeah, so abuse of uh, creation and everything and started saying that our conduct has been sinful towards creation. From that, it was taken over by the Catholic Church, by the Pope, who put together an encyclical letter called Laudato Si about creation. 
Then at a conference in Istanbul, the Islamic community tagged on to this and put their support behind this to the point that all the religions galvanized behind this call for the care of creation. So that is already happening and it's pushing, uh, whole, it's, at, it's uh, displayed at all the cuffs, you know, from cup 15, uh, 21, which happened in Paris, to the subsequent cups. The religious groups come together to emphasize our responsibility to care for creation. Mm. Well, I'm taking a, a lot out of this, this panel. Re, you know, religion can be a unifier, and religion can also be a positive force as a part as a business partner, which you know I think is a kind of a, kind of a new. It's probably not a new concept, but it's a concept that people are starting to take very seriously. And I, I, I just, if the entire world could talk as respectfully as this panel, all coming from you know different backgrounds and different perspectives. Uh, we'd be in a very good place. I appreciate each of you. I appreciate each of you for your leadership, uh, and I uh, appreciate WEF for, for convening this because it's not the kind of panel you would have seen probably in, a lot, in previous years. So thank you for being part of that history, and again, thank you all for, for coming out today. We appreciate it. Thank you.